Good morning, everyone. I never know how near or far to stand from the mic, so hopefully everyone can hear me. It's really great to see everyone this morning on this absolutely glorious summer's day, spring, we still in spring. Yep, how's that? All good? Yeah. So yeah, it's great to see you all this morning, um, enjoying this glorious weather. Um, just before we start, we're going to have a couple of songs, but we had a visit this week from a friend of ours, um, lovely um, Christian lady. Um, boy, does she like to talk. Uh, she likes to talk, and when, you, when you're with her, she is so enthusiastic for the Lord and for sharing God's blessings, and it was a real, real blessed time. Um, I got home from work and she was in full flow and me coming in didn't, didn't stop her at all. So. But um, she did just share, she didn't share the verse, but she, she, be, she sort of mentioned the words and I looked up the verse after she'd gone, um, somewhat eventually. And um, yeah, it was, yeah, she, if she's watching this later on, I we love you. Anyway, um, Psalm, Psalm 84, um, 11 and 12. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. And this is, this is the best bit. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one, <coughs> is the one who trusts in you. And it was those middle lines. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God has got an abundance of blessings for us that you just can't help but lavish upon us all the time. Listen. Um, I, need, I need your help with this to really sing out because when we're singing a hymn, there's verses and I can't always see all the words. So I encourage you to really sing out and just put, put Christ on the throne where he is, crowned him with many crowns. Let's stand. <laughs>
Jesus, for all that you are, for all that you have done for us. You truly are majesty. Lord, there is no one like you. We love you with all our hearts. We thank you, Lord. That is only possibly God, possible because you first loved us. So thank you, Jesus. We declare from the depths of our hearts and our being that you are truly majesty. Thank you, God. I want to thank you, God, that you you want us and you we are your desire, even though we're just um, really nothing in our human selves, yet you've chosen us, you've called <coughs> us, and you, you love us. And, you know, you are the king of all kings, and we are humbled at your feet, Lord God, to know that we can actually uh, come into your presence daily. We, you, and we're so grateful, Lord, for help us to live in that gratefulness, Lord God. Help us to realise how uh, truly worthy you are, and yet you choose us, and you want us, and you love us. Thank you, God. Again, we thank you that we can meet together, uh, we can have fellowship together, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you are the focal point of that. You're the reason why we're here. And I just praise you, Lord, that indeed you are the King of Kings eternally, Lord. And we just thank you for your forgiveness, your mercy to us, your patience with us, Lord, and everything that you bless us with. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Please sit there. Um, yeah, again, just another warm welcome. Um, we do have things on during the week. We have growth groups, um, three, I think. There's an online group and two in-person groups. If you'd like, if you're new and you'd like to uh, attend one of those in some way, then um, please speak to any of us, really, that are here regularly. Um, you can sign up for the WhatsApp group as well. Um, following today's service, uh, there will be a short um, members meeting, just so we can discuss briefly and pray about the um, the days ahead with most of the seats being taken. Um, so we're going to discuss that afterwards just briefly. Um, like I said, there is a WhatsApp group, uh, which is a way of encouraging each other and staying in touch throughout the week. So again, if you'd like to sign up for that, just speak to Chris or Ryan um, following the service. Uh, next weekend is the coronation uh, weekend. There will be um, a coronation market, as it were, um, in the grounds surrounding the, the hall here. Um, we will have a stall up as well, and we're going to have a picnic, which I believe is going to be around this side. So please come prepared. Hopefully the weather next week will be like it is today. Uh, be a great time of uh, uh, food and fellowship, which is a great thing in itself so yeah good morning everybody um we're going to do a bit of a trust game this morning um and asha's going to come and help me do this so i can't asha thank you where are you wonderful and i think g can yeah. you come and help as well i don't know can i take this out yeah. of a control system okay um i don't know if you've done trust games at all but we're just going to do a really simple one which is the lean back you know the lean back one? Yeah. So Asha, all you have to do, you just have to close your eyes. 
And then when I, I'll count to three, and then when I count to three, you just lean back and G is going to catch you. Okay? Is that going to be all right? Do you have a little look at G? Do you think he can do it? It's good. Okay. All right then. So close your eyes. Okay. One, two, three, go. Oh my goodness. You did an amazing job. Right, we're going we're gonna to swap round now. Right, G, G, you're going to come here. Okay? And I'll do the same. Close your eyes, count to three, and you just lean back. No? Is it not so short? I should.
thank you again for your wonderfulness, Lord. Thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for forgiveness, Lord. Thank you again for this time of fellowship now. I just uh, bring Ryan to you. Thank you for the time that we've put in this week, Lord, to bring in uh, your words for us, Lord. Make us receptive uh, to what you have for us now, Lord. Amen. 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 Oh. Sorry, the children can go out now. I hope as you came in, you were given a handout and a pen to be able to use. So if you don't have that, please raise your hand and we'll get somebody to bring it over to you. Got Jeff in the back, got Margo up here. You are going to need both. If you've been with us the last few weeks, um, you kind of know that we've been going through this series called Transformed Along the Journey, which is talking about the life of Peter and how his life was changed by his relationship and his encounter and his journey with Christ. If you haven't been here the last few weeks, the first part is going to kind of be a recap and be able to kind of fill you in on what we've been doing the last few weeks. And, and first thing we need to do is we kind of want to look at our steps along the journey so far. So we had these, these first two phases. And the, the thing that we need to see, remember, is that as we are beginning this relationship, this journey, that God is working in our lives even before we join him on the journey. So as you see up here, the, the little blanks, the, the blanks on your paper are the, the yellow words up here. And so it just helps us kind of have notes to take home. But just the fact that God is working in our lives before we even start with him on the journey. One of the things I love is that God gave us Jesus, which was the answer to the question that we didn't even know we had at first. But when, as we go through life, we realize there's, there's a hole that only he can fill. We see people all the time trying to fill it with different things. But the only one that can actually fill that hole is Christ. Now, as, as Peter was going along this journey, the first challenge that he had was to follow me. That's what Jesus told him. He said, hey, I want you to follow me. And he enters into this phase of new relationship, both with God and with others. He starts this relationship with Christ, and he's able to, to, to watch Jesus in a day-by-day -day situation. Let me just say something that we probably all know. If you want to see someone's flaws, be with them every day, all day, and they will show themselves very easily. Um, I think like when, when you're in friendships or, or, or marriages or different things like that, we know the good, the bad, and the ugly of our closest friends and partners and everything else, don't we? We know the, the good things, we know the bad things. And so when Jesus is inviting him into this relationship, understand this, Peter gets a front row seat, except Peter finds out real quick, Jesus doesn't have all those flaws. But he begins to see his own flaws very quickly in his first encounters with Christ. And yet Jesus still said, hey, I want you to come and follow me. And in this first phase of new relationships, what we see is it's this time of watching and learning. He's observing. He's, he's seeing him day to day and seeing what he can glean and what he can learn from Jesus. Another thing is, is this, this time of receiving the ministry of others. Peter doesn't say much in this first phase of new relationship. He doesn't do much. He's simply like that sponge that's just soaking it up. And, and when we start our walk with Christ, we're kind of the same way. We, we see others that are on this journey. We're, we're observing what they do. We're observing them when they, they are going through life. We see the good times, the bad times, how they react, how they act. Sometimes we see good examples. Sometimes we don't. Why? Because none of us are perfect. But yet we're all on this journey together. However, we are not designed to stay at this stage. We are to grow and to move along on this journey. The things that you learned in primary school, they are a good base for things that we learn in secondary and then what we have to use throughout life, right? But we don't want to stay in that primary school mentality, do we? Do we just get our little kids that are in primary school and to send them into a job and be like, go ahead, have at it, kid? Why not? Because they're not prepared. They're not ready. They haven't learned all the different skills that we build on. I, I think it's so funny how 
so many people are like, oh, you know, teaching, what's the big deal? Um, all of us had to go through that and learn stuff in order to get where we are in life, right? Those foundational things. So for Peter, in this phase of relationship, that's what the foundation was being built. He needed it so that when Jesus calls him to step out later, he's got that foundation built. Which brings us to the second challenge that God had. And that is a time where Jesus says, you know, who do you say that I am? And he enters a phase of new identity, becoming an obvious follower of Christ. Now, the word obvious, it's obvious what it means, right? We, we, we can't be sitting back just being a, a sponge or in that new relationship observation phase our whole Christian walk, our whole time on this journey. There's a time where we're called to step out in faith and begin to follow in a different way. It's a time to begin living out the things we learned in phase one. So basically that, that sponge is full, and then all of a sudden it can't keep any more water, so therefore water starts coming out. It's that learning from those things and now doing and participating in those things. Now, does that mean we're going to do it perfectly? No, we will mess up sometimes too. But remember, we can look to the left and the right and see others that are along the journey with us and go, oh, they mess up too. Okay, we're in this together. We have a perfect Savior, but we're on the journey with a bunch of imperfect people, including the person that we see in the mirror. But that's the cool thing that God gives us this church family. God gives us other believers to be able to walk along this journey. It's a time to take the first public steps in faith, in service, and ministry. We saw that in the life of Peter when, when he was used to, to, to help feed the 5,000 as he was helping organize and, and then serve people. We see it when he stepped out of the boat, when Jesus said, go ahead, come, come to me. And he steps out and he walks on water and he gets distracted. And when he gets distracted, he starts to sink again. Jesus immediately grabs his hand and says, hey, I'm here. It's a learning experience. It's also a time of ups and downs where the relationships from phase one will help us thrive and survive. I don't know if you guys have ever messed up in doing something and then someone came along and said, hey, guess what? I've messed up that way too. Let me, let me help you maybe fill in a gap or, or learn something that maybe you didn't know before and, and all of a sudden they're walking with you in that journey. But we will have these ups and downs. We will have this time that we are having to lean on each other as we walk in this journey. And then that brings us to the next phase or the things that lead up to the next phase in Peter's life. And so as we do this, we, we look before the crucifixion. It says that Christ predicts Peter's denial. We're going to read through that as, as we go forward because we need to see the steps and the things that happen in Peter's life to understand how that new challenge comes about and how he was prepared and challenged in that way. So it says in Luke 22, starting in verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. So Peter, in his boldness, remember he's still in his stick your foot in your mouth face at this point. It's like, Lord, I'm never going to, I'm never going to let you do this alone. And Jesus goes, the reality is you will. And you're going to forget, you're going to act like you don't even know me. It's that, that, that fear that comes in that all of a sudden when we, we are challenged that our faith won't really shine or not. This is part of those ups and downs that we see in the life of Peter and the journey. Then we see in Luke 22, 54 to 62, it's, it's this account. Just as Jesus was arrested, it says, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. So notice he's already, he's already got that fear space going on. And when some there had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. 
Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now, can you imagine the moment where Peter had said it? He hears the rooster crow. All the things that Jesus said come into his mind, and he looks up and he catches eyes with Jesus. Can you imagine how he must have felt in that moment? There probably wasn't a lower low that he could have experienced in his life up to that point. Because he had recognized Jesus as Messiah. He had recognized that he was the Son of God. And now here he is denying him in front of everybody out of fear. And so Peter must have felt sickened with himself, disgusted with himself. I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you. There have been times in my life where I've messed up and I hated the reflection that I looked at in the mirror. Because I'm sitting there going, how dumb do you have to be to mess up when you know the right thing to do? That's probably how Peter felt in that moment. And that's what also makes what follows so amazing. Because it truly shows the grace and mercy of God and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So now we look <coughs> sorry, after the resurrection. And if we look in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 7, you, you have the, the morning of the resurrection. What we just celebrated a few weeks ago on Easter, and it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might anoint Jesus' body. <coughs> Sorry. Rush, can you bring me water? Oh, where am I? Very early on the first day of the week, Sorry, I'm going to start coughing. <laughs> Just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in, in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell the disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now why did he specifically name Peter? Because he wanted Peter to know he was still in this relationship. He was still on the journey. He was still loved by Christ. He was still loved by those that were going to be around him. When we mess up, sometimes it helps with someone to go, you know what, I know you messed up. I still love you. I'm still behind you. I'm still with you. Because that is the most obvious grace that we can, can share. And so here, the angel is sitting there telling him, look, tell the disciples and make sure Peter knows too. Make sure that Peter knows that he will see him in Galilee, just as he said he was going to. So then we, we see in John 21, 15 to 19. And this is where, where Jesus has already done a miracle again. Where he's on the shoreline and he's, he sees them. The guys out in the boat, they had gone out to fish, caught nothing. And he yells out to them, hey, you got any fish? And they're like, no. It's like, throw, throw the net on the other side. Once again, a contradictory thing to what a fisherman would have done. Because they always did it over one side of the boat. And he's like, no, throw it on the other side. And it's when that happened that Peter realized, that's John Peter said, that, that's Jesus. And the thing I think is, one of the funny little things on this is, as they get to shore with the fish, Jesus has already got fish cooking there for breakfast and stuff like that. He's like, I've already provided before I provided for you. And then we have this here in John 21, 15 and 19. He says, when they had finished eating, 
Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger and dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Those two words keep popping up, don't they? Follow me. But before he initiated, kind of asked him to follow him again, he had to build him back up. Because Peter felt empty. I don't know if anybody made this connection to how many times did Peter deny Christ? Three. How many times did he ask him if he loved him? Three. So for each denial, we now have an affirmation. For each denial, we now have an instruction. And Jesus is trying to get him to see, look, I still love you. But understand, you're at the point now where you are given a new job. Remember at the beginning, he told him, I want, you to make, I want to make you fishers of men, right? Now he's given him a totally different occupation. What happens if a fisherman tries to take care of sheep on a boat? It's not going to work, right? He's changing his whole mindset. But he had to go through phase one and phase two to get to that mindset change. He had to go through the observing and, and the new relationships to the new identity because now he's going to give him something new. And the challenge here is very simple. Do you love me? Because if we love someone, we will act upon that, right? If we simply say, I love you, and never do anything to show our love, is the person going to believe it or feel love? No. We talked about it in our marriage MOT thing a few weeks ago, the, the different love languages that people have and how they feel love. One thing is, is for certain, it doesn't matter what language you have, there has to be some kind of action to show that love. There's got to be some kind of thing other than just, well, you know I love you. If they never do anything or say anything or, or show in any kind of tangible way that you love someone, then talk is cheap. And so here we have the, the thing, do you love me? He says, okay, yes. So the instruction here is, okay, if you love me, Jesus says, I want you to be a shepherd. So he's telling a fisherman, I want you to be a shepherd. This is a big shift for Peter. He goes from being a fisher of men to feed and tend my sheep or take care of my sheep. So we have this shift that occurs. We have this shift in a mindset. Now the question is, why a shepherd? Because God sees shepherding as an all-encompassing reflection of God himself. A shepherd nurtures, leads to feeding and watering, guides through uncertain terrain, keeps the flock together, protects the flock from danger, and will go after one who has strayed from the group. Now, I don't know how many of us have actually been around an actual shepherd or not. It's not a very glorious job. Sheep stink, and they're kind of dumb. They get themselves into trouble all the time. Okay? And so when he's saying, look, I, I want you to be a shepherd. He said, you're going to have to deal with some stinky situations, and sometimes people are going to make dumb choices. But I still want you to be a shepherd. I want you to care. I want you to nurture. I want, to, I want you to protect. I want you to lead them to the right paths and then protect them when they're in their pens. Because understand this, and during this time, you would have these, these rock walls, and they would get their sheep into this, this area. And then guess who was the door? The shepherd. They were the shep they were the one that would be the door to protect anything from coming in or going out. They were the ones that were going to love 
then no matter what, even if one of them straight off gets in trouble, he is going to leave the, the many to go find the one to love and to care and to nurture that sheep. So Peter accepts this challenge and he moves on to this, this next phase in phase three, and that is a phase of new purpose. Peter's given a new purpose for his life from here on out. So all the plans Peter might have thought he had in life up to this point, he's going, no, no, no. I need you to realize this is going to be your purpose from now on. This is the next phase that you're going to be on. And that is being a shepherd. Caring, loving, teaching, nurturing. So what does this mean for us? What should our next step be? Well, first thing is, if you've not begun the journey, accept Jesus now. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. You know, Chris and Jeff and myself, one, one of the things that we do is we, we try to answer as many questions as we can. If someone's struggling or, or, or has questions, don't feel embarrassed if you have a question. There's nothing wrong with having questions. But, but no one can answer the question if you don't ask it. The next thing is if you're in phase one, grow in the relationships that you have. Grow in relationships here in the church. Grow in relationship with those who are walking along the same journey. Don't be afraid to sit there and say, well, I'm struggling with this. Because guess what? You don't know that somebody else might have struggled with it in the past or is struggling with it. And you go, okay, well, maybe we can help each other out. Maybe we can keep each other accountable and we can walk through this together. That's the beauty of when you have multiple people on the journey. We can walk together. We can struggle together. We can affirm together. We can encourage together. In 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, Desire the, the sincere milk of the word. So when we're, we're in that first phase, it's, it's kind of like we're, we're getting the, 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 big, the milk that from when we're little. You can't give little ones straight food right away. That would be a disaster. They have to have the milk first. And Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaken the assembling together. Being in church with other believers is essential in our walk with Christ. It's not something we can do alone. This relationship with Christ is meant to be done in community, in a church family, in a group. Now, what does that mean? There will be ups and downs with relationships in and out, of, in and out throughout the body. There may be a time where all of a sudden someone offends you or says something or does something offensive, and you have to sit there and, and talk it through with the one another that we, we talked about a few weeks ago. But if we have two people who are committed to doing it God's way, there's nothing that cannot be worked through and resolved. But it takes two people to do that. Now, the, word, the world says something different. The world says, you know what? When somebody hurts you, burn that bridge and move on. All you get is a bunch of angry, hurt people at that point. God's way is better. Take advantage of your time as an observer, but don't just stay on this phase of the journey. <coughs> so take the time to learn to observe, to seek out during this phase. The second thing we do is we become an obvious follower of Christ and grow in this new identity. Become an obvious follower of Christ and grow in your new identity. So what does that mean? That means take steps of obedience, whether it's baptism or church membership or giving, different things where we see this growth in an obvious way. Join with others in a growth group and learn to live out your faith. Now I'll be honest with you, our goal is that people have different ways that they can be connected and grow. So we have our growth groups, yes. You said I say, well, I can't make growth groups. Okay, then we can do one-to-ones or we can do small group studies with people um, the women have two different groups going right now. We're wanting to start up some stuff for the guys too. 
All these things are different opportunities to be able to grow in our relationship with each other and grow in our relationship with Christ. Sometimes that means going, okay, I, I'm going to make this a priority regardless. What if the footy's on? Well, yep, yeah, we may have to miss a match or two. You say, well, I've got so much going on. Yep, and that's when we have to prioritize this relationship. Seek out tools to search the scriptures for yourself and then be doers of the word and not hearers only. We have to be studying our Bible. We have to, because if we don't know the Bible, we don't come to know God. If we don't know God, then how are we going to have a relationship with him? I think I've used this relationship before. I've got three sons. They will always be my sons no matter what. They are genetically linked to me whether they like it or not. But if I don't talk to them for two years, do I have a relationship and know them? No, I don't. Well, then how do we expect to have a relationship with God if we don't know him? If we're not in his word, if we're not spending time in prayer and, and having this interaction? It's got to be something that we do. And you say, you may sit there and say, well, I don't really know how to study my Bible. Great. Okay. That's something we can work on. We can do a one-to-one -one where we talk about how to go about reading and studying God's word. There's an answer to the question. <laughs> Begin to serve others and participate in team ministry. So that could mean helping out with the welcome. That could mean helping setting up chairs. That could mean helping out with the sound. That could mean helping with the kids. There's tons of different ways that we can serve one another and step out and, and grow in our walk. So they say, well, I'm not a really in front of people kind of person. That's fine. There's plenty of things that can be done that's not up in front of people. It always brings to mind this, this little old Cuban gentleman that when I was growing up. He was about this big, very, very soft-spoken. He would, if you ever put him in front of a group of people, he would turn into a statue. Would not talk. But every single Friday and Saturday, he would walk from his house, which was a little less than a mile away. And when I say walk, he, he really would just shuffle. And, and he would walk, and then he would fold every bulletin that we had for the church. He'd fold it and then put the envelope in and the, any other handouts in. And, he, and that was his ministry. Every week. And he was faithful in doing it. Every week. Now, most people didn't know that he was doing it, and that was fine. But he was part of the church, serving the body, and getting involved. There's always a chance to serve. There's always a chance to serve in team ministry. Next thing is being a participant in what God is doing around you, but don't just stay at this phase on the journey. So being a participant, being involved, Doing something together on this phase. But once again, notice, we don't stop at this phase. We continue to grow. And that's when we have the next one. Accept the challenge of being a shepherd of God's sheep. Now, does this mean that everyone is called to become a pastor or a preacher or something like that? No. But we can still shepherd others. See, we're, we're called to be shepherd as leaders. We're called to be shepherds, but really we're, we're under shepherds because Jesus is the shepherd of us all. And then we're serving as, as he's shown us, we now try to serve the church body. And that's a continuous thing throughout the body. You may not realize, but when, like, when Kirsten goes out, she's shepherding little kids right now, shepherding little hearts. And you sit there and go, yep, they look like a bunch of sheep because they want to go everywhere. Yep. Adults do the same thing, except usually our wandering is a lot worse. But we're called to be shepherds of God's sheep. In Scripture, we find no other career option for a follower of Christ than to grow into being a shepherd. I think it's funny when people say, I'm not a people person. 
If it's your kind of people, all of a sudden you become a people person, don't you? <laughs> well, I'm an introvert. Great. You can still have some type of relationship because we're all made for relationship. We're all made for community. That's how God made us, to seek out relationships. And so if we're going to follow Christ and continue to follow him, there, there's no other end point other than shepherding. Serving and shepherding. At this phase, you become an owner in what God is doing around you. We take ownership. All of a sudden, we, we're involved and we're going, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out in faith. You sit there and say, well, I, I, I don't want to talk in front of a lot of people. Okay, maybe you've been following Christ for a long time and you want to be involved in helping with a one-to-one. -one. That puts you with one other person. Great. But you're shepherding. All of these things are just showing growth as we step forward in our relationship. You become a minister and not just a member. You become a student and not just a listener. See the difference there? We become a minister, not just a member. We become a student, not just a listener. There's initiative. There's growth. As we follow Christ, there will be a continuous thing where we are called to step up and follow in faith. If it's not a blind faith, we know exactly who we're putting our faith in. Remember this. God doesn't call us to do anything that he doesn't prepare us to do ahead of time. There have been many times in my life where God's called me to do something and I had a list of excuses why that was not a good idea. And then God takes away the excuses. And you're like, no, shoot. But the best that God wants for us is in these next steps. And his best is immeasurably more than what we can think of, what we, we can dream of. Because all of a sudden, it's not just us. It's, it's impacting others as well. And we can serve and walk and love together. And then all of a sudden, when the community, when the people around us look in, they go, wait a minute, there's something different. Here. Yeah. There's something different compared to what the world has. Yes. Right there on the bottom of your seat, it says, Joy and very much fruit comes when we fulfill our purpose and shepherd others. So as we continue this, this journey, we have this relationship phase, the identity phase, the purpose phase. And we've got one more that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. If we have our all age service next week. So they're saying, well, why is it on a roundabout? Because when we're, when we're in this purpose and then the next phase, then we're helping those that are in the relationships and identity phase. And it just keeps going around. And the great thing is God calls us to do this along with those others that are on the journey. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that... First of all, you give us the answer before we even knew there was a question. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you love us so much that we see so many examples of grace in your word and in our lives and the lives around us. Lord, we just pray that we would continue to step out in faith, Lord, that we would continue to walk and follow you. Lord, that we would not get, let ourselves get stuck in a phase, Lord, but that we would seek you out daily so that we can move on serve and love others. Lord, if there, there's people here that feel like they may be stuck, Lord, I pray that you would help them to, to come and talk to Jeff or Chris or myself, Lord. Or if there's anybody here that's got questions, Lord, we pray that they would have the strength and the boldness to ask it. Lord, and we just pray that as a church family, Lord, that we would show the love of your son Jesus in and around our community, Lord. Lord, help us to grow individually, help us to grow as a body. And Lord, help us in the steps forward. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>